Media International Center. Let me welcome you all to the Vipulak Memorial Lecture. It is indeed an honor for us to co-host this lecture with the IIC and the great Assam Media Partners in the memory of leading sinologist and academic of the country, Professor Vipulak. To deliver the prestigious Vipulak Memorial Lecture, we have with us Professor Andrew J. Nathan, Professor of Political Science, Columbia University. As you may all know, Professor Nathan's teaching and research interests include Chinese politics and foreign policy, comparative study of political participation and political culture, and human rights. His books include Chinese Democracy, the Tiananmen Papers, co-edited with Terry Link, China's Search for Security, co-authored with Andrew Scobell, and Will China Democratize, co-edited with Larry Diamond and Mark Blacknock. Professor Nathan has served at Columbia as director of the Weatherhead East Asian Institute from 1991 to 1995, chair of the executive committee of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences from 2002 to 2003, and chair of the Department of Political Science from 2003 to 2006. He is currently chair of the Morningside Institutional Review Board. Off campus, he is an Asia and Pacific book reviewer for foreign affairs, a member of the steering committee of the Asian Barometer Survey, and a board member of Human Rights in China. Professor Nathan is a former member of the boards of the National Endowment for Democracy, Freedom House, and Human Rights Watch. This evening, Professor Nathan will be speaking on the topic, Biden's China Policy, Old Wine and New Bottles. And to chair the event today, we have with us Professor Srimati Chakrabarti, Chairperson, Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi. Before I invite the chair to begin the proceedings, let me lay out the ground rules. All participants except the speakers will be muted for the duration of the event. Participants are requested to send in their questions via the chat box or use the raise hand option. Please unmute yourself only when called upon to do so by the chair. I will now invite the chair to begin the proceedings. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Rija. On behalf of the Institute of Chinese Studies, I welcome all of you to this VP Dutt Memorial Lecture 2021. And special welcome to Professor Andrew Nathan, who has very kindly consented to speak today. Uh, we have been organizing the VP Dutt Memorial Lecture for the last few years in collaboration with the India International Center. So my special thanks to them too. Uh, today we were expecting to have Ms. Anuradha Dutt, Professor Dutt's daughter, who's the sponsor of this event. Uh, she's an eminent lawyer and also an alumni of Columbia University. Uh, and she was uh, to uh, be here, but uh, she sends her regrets because there was a personal tragedy. Her, she lost her uncle, Professor Dutt's brother, to COVID uh, yesterday. So she has apologized for not being able to come here. Now, Professor V.P. Dutt, a little bit about him. Professor V.P. Dutt was born in Sialkot, West Punjab. Uh, which falls in Pakistan today on June 4th, 1925, and passed away on April 26, 2011. Uh, we celebrate his, uh, we, uh, you know, organized this uh, event uh, the month that he uh, passed away. Uh, all these years we've had it in April, but last year because of uh, COVID, we couldn't hold it in April. We, we held it in October. But this year, here we are back to April. Uh, Professor Dutt pioneered Chinese studies in India, uh, and he's considered to be the father of modern China studies in India. He set up the Center for Chinese Studies in Delhi University in 1964, uh, which later became the Department of Chinese and Japanese Studies, and today it is called the Department of East Asian Studies. He graduated from Lahore University, proceeded to the US to study international relations in Stanford University, Later, he, along with his wife, Gargi Dutt, went to China in 1957 as part of the first cultural exchange program between the two governments, Indian and Chinese governments. Later, he went to Harvard University as a research fellow while working on his PhD, which he completed from the School of International Studies. As for Professor Nathan, um, uh, Rija has introduced him, but I will uh, just on a personal note say this. Well, first I would say that he is uh, one of the renowned top China scholars of the world. He has a PhD from Harvard University too. And uh, uh, he was my teacher in Columbia University 
when uh, my uh, supervisor, when my thesis advisor, Professor Tom Bernstein, went on sabbatical uh, in 1981. It was the same year when I was taking my comprehensive exams. Professor Nathan guided me through it while uh, taking my written as well as my orals. He was, uh, you know, a great support, and I'm indebted to him up to this day for that. Today, he'll be speaking on the Biden administration's China policy. This is perhaps the most uh, important subject in contemporary world today. Since the end of the Cold War, uh, US-China relations have had many ups and downs. During the Trump administration, there were more downs than ups. What it is going to be like in, uh, in the um, uh, Biden period, we would like to hear from Professor Nathan. He has deep insights into it. He's been teaching Chinese foreign policy along with internal Chinese politics. However, most people hoped that uh, the Trump administration, uh, whatever, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, things will be very different in the Biden administration. But Professor Nathan calls his, uh, his lecture um, old wine in new bottles. So probably he doesn't see too much of change in it. But of course, it's only been 100 days that uh, uh, Biden has been in power. But nevertheless, we all look forward to this lecture. And I'm sure we'll be enlightened by the end of the lecture. So thank you again, Professor Nathan, for uh, agreeing to deliver this lecture. So the floor is over to you. It's all yours now. Well, thank you, Srimati and Dr. Nair for that very nice introduction. I'm very honored to be here um, and speak to honor Dr. VP Dutt. I'm sorry that I cannot be there in person, but of course the pandemic makes that impossible. And I've been very alarmed by the news that I'm reading about the pandemic in India. And I'm happy to see that there are so many people uh, participating in this uh, in this event because I, I guess it means that you're all in good health, those who are participating. So that's a bit of good news and I hope you will stay in good health. When, uh, when Srimati and I started, I started studying China a little bit earlier than Srimati did in the 1960s as an undergraduate, but even in the 70s when she came to Columbia to study it and she had already been studying it in India, China was not a subject that so many people were interested in, but it has become extremely important uh, to all of us, to all of us in the United States and to all of you in India. So obviously Professor Dutt was very foresighted as Srimati has already said, in, in launching this field of study in India. And it has developed uh, to a great extent and you have a distinguished cadre of China specialists in academia and in the diplomatic corps and in the business community now. So it's really an honor for me to speak with you. My topic uh, today has a question mark after it, at least that's what I, <laughs> had sent over for the announcement, Biden's China policy, old wine in new bottles, question mark, because I, um, I'm not saying that there's nothing new. Um, what I'm saying is that on the surface, Biden's China policy looks similar to that of Trump, but deep down inside, it's rather different in some important ways. In a superficial sense, Biden has continued some of, has not, has not abandoned, let's put it that way, so far, some of Trump's important um, policies that he implemented, including the tariffs, including the emphasis on the quad, including the stepped up naval patrols in the South China Sea, and including the upgrade in the protocol status of Taiwan. And these continuities are grounded upon a deeper continuity, which is that in the Trump administration, it was the time when American policy decisively pivoted from engagement to a position 
that the Trump administration in one of its documents labeled strategic competition. <clears throat> that pivot had been in the making for some time. People had been, of course, noticing the so-called rise of China, especially since the 1990s, the tremendous growth in the Chinese economy, the tremendous increase in the sophistication of Chinese technology, the steady double digit growth in most years of the Chinese defense budget and the creation by China gradually of a bigger and bigger Navy in particular. Um, but the debate had been ongoing for some time when, uh, as to what this really meant. And under Deng Xiaoping and under uh, Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao, the Chinese government continued to project an image of you know, relative modesty and cooperation. With the rise of Xi Jinping, the more assertive Chinese foreign policy and military policy became evident. And that intensified the debate in the United States. And with the rise of Trump, it sort of um, uh, brought to a head this line of thinking in the United States. And there is now a very broad consensus among both Republicans and Democrats in government and academia, even in the business community, in media, that China is a, some kind of a threat and the, uh, as I say, the official slogan for this that has kind of risen to the top and uh, around which everyone can agree is that China is a strategic competitor. <clears throat> Looking back, the emergence of China as a strategic competitor was, I would say, was inevitable. That doesn't mean that everybody predicted it, and <laughs> but the reasons for it are very understandable. Some of you may know that in 2012, I uh, published a co-authored book with Andrew Scobell called China's Search for Security. And in that book, we pointed out that from a Beijing point of view, from a China-centered point of view, China's security was, and this is still the case now, was very vulnerable. China had many internal problems. China had important uh, territorial control issues like Tibet, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, Taiwan, from their point of view, a territorial control issue. They had a rapidly rising middle class that was ideologically um, unstable in terms of its commitment to the vision that the Chinese Communist Party had. But very importantly for the current US-China relationship, China was surrounded by the United States and its allies, which remains the case today. The United States has, as you all know, very large military deployments in, a, in the region of Asia and has been the dominant military power in the Western Pacific and the South China Sea and so forth for, for decades. And I think that no government of China whether it's a communist government or a democratic government, or if Sri Mati and I became the president and vice president of China, and we were responsible for China's security, no government of China could really accept permanently this position of American, uh, uh, of the United States sort of surrounding China and having the capability, if it wanted to do so, to cut off China's access to imports of oil and raw materials and, th and things of that kind. It's just not an acceptable situation for a sovereign state. Uh, I remember when Donald Rumsfeld, then the US Secretary of Defense was at the Shangri-La conference in Singapore and asked the Chinese defense minister, why are you building up your military? Nobody is threatening you. That was, uh, <laughs> you know, a hypocritical question because Rumsfeld knew better than anybody else that the United States had its had a potential stranglehold on China in a military and economic sense. So of course the Chinese government has done the things that it has done. There's a question of its, uh, the way it's done it, the timing that it's done it, but it was inevitable that China would push back against the United States, and it was inevitable that in due course, American policymakers would become alarmed about this because for the United States, the preservation of our 
I say our, I mean, I'm not in the government, the, the preservation of the United States inherited incumbent position of dominance in Asia is also an, a natural behavior in international politics. One, one has an advantage and one wishes to, to maintain it. So the, the, the rise of the, the emergence of this situation of strategic competition was, uh, I would say was inevitable and makes sense in terms of international relations theory or what we know about the behavior of states. However, <clears throat> The way in which the Trump administration dealt with that problem was uh, short-sighted, lacked strategy, and lacked coordination. Trump himself, as we all know, is not a long-term thinker, not a strategic thinker. And if anything, his major concern was always with his domestic political support and how he could sell himself to the American public. And he chose to do so by placing an emphasis on the trade deficit and said that trade wars are easy to win and put on these tariffs. And he really had himself no other interest in the issue of China than the trade deficit. And as you all know, his strategy for dealing with the trade deficit itself was a failure. He, he allowed other members of his administration to kind of run wild with their own China policies. And there were many different such policies. So his one of his trade advisors, Peter Navarro, had an ambition to achieve the complete decoupling of the two economies. And he pushed on that as much as he could. That did not succeed, but that was his policy. The official trade negotiator, Robert Lighthizer, much more professional individual in this area, um, had in mind trying to change the Chinese economic model to, to make it more like what the United States viewed as a so-called level playing field. That didn't work either. Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, along with Mike Pence, the Vice President, put forward an extremely alarmist view of China as a threat to Western civilization. And in one of his last speeches as Secretary of State, Pompeo even advocated that US policy should be to encourage the Chinese people to overthrow the Chinese Communist Party. Other members of the administration were focused on domestic security issues in the United States. So the head of the FBI, Christopher Wray, launched a so-called China project to try to root out uh, Chinese spies in the United States who were stealing technology. And Matt Pottinger, the senior China official in the National Security Council, was concerned about China sending security agents to the United States uh, to, to threaten Chinese who had taken refuge here and so forth. So they all had their different agendas and there was no coordination. This is where the question mark in my talk title comes in because I don't think that the Biden policy is, is completely old wine in new bottles. I think that the Biden policy is different from the Trump policy in one very big important way, which then has a number of categories underneath it. The one big important difference with the Trump policy is that the Biden policy is actually strategic. It is based upon a long-term view of how the United States can defend its position in the international system against the ambitions of China and how in doing so, the United States can gradually shape the options that China faces and their shape the behavior of China. It is strategic and it is coordinated. So I'm sure that everybody in this audience is quite, you know, knows the facts that I know. So I can allude to them, you know, sort of briefly. But as you all know, Biden has appointed Kurt Campbell as the so-called Asia Czar in the National Security Council. And Kurt Campbell is an official who has served many times in democratic administrations and has 
uh, great depth of knowledge about Asia and knows all of the leaders in Asia and all of the uh, you know, issues in Asia and so forth. And he is in charge of coordinating it. And Biden has hired a lot of other China experts throughout the administration, others in the National Security Council, others in the State Department, the Defense Department, the Office of the Trade Representative, and so on and so forth. So Campbell, so they're all very sophisticated and Campbell will be coordinating their activity. What is this strategy that the Biden administration has, uh, has begun to show us in managing the China relationship? The first part of it, and this has become a cliche, you know, when you read uh, Dr. Nair, I think mentioned that I, I do the Asia and Pacific book review sections in Foreign Affairs, the magazine that's considered the most influential and the oldest uh, U.S. journal on foreign policy. And so I read the, the, I write the Asia Pacific book reviews, but I read the whole magazine, of course. And it used to be that, uh, that every third issue would have an article on China. And now just about every uh, article that's in foreign affairs will, even if it's about health, if it's about technology, if it's about uh, you know Russia, if it's about the Middle East, we'll have a number of paragraphs at least on China because China is now everywhere. And what has become a cliche in these articles is the final paragraph that says, our China policy needs to start with needs to start at home in the United States, fixing what's wrong with the United States. And yes, that is item number one of Biden's China policy is to start at home, to take this word competition in the phrase strategic competition, literally, and say, okay, if we're competing, we have to compete. You know, I think the idea that, that we will change China in either by making China more friendly to us or by somehow destroying, you know, preventing the rise of China and pushing China back down. Those ideas are, are gone from Biden's policy. They haven't disappeared from the public discourse, but they're marginalized in the public discourse because neither of those concepts really makes any sense, I must say. Uh, but we have to accept China as it is. China may change. China is bound to change. We're all bound to change as time goes by in one way or another, but it's not going to be done by us. And it may not be, probably won't be the changes that we would prefer. So therefore, competition has to start from home. This is actually convenient for Biden because Biden's first priority really is at home. I mean, his domestic policy is not really driven by China. Uh, it is driven by his progressive agenda, uh, by his uh, concern to restore the middle class, to restore the economy, to, and so on and so forth. But China becomes very convenient as, as a motivator for this domestic policy. So as you know, Biden ran on the platform of Build Back Better, and then having become president gave this speech where he said, if we're gonna compete with China, we have to show that democracy really works. So it's kind of like Sputnik. I'm old enough to remember when the Russians launched Sputnik and when the uh, president uh, Kennedy then said, you know, we, we have to compete. It's a convenient reason to, to try to persuade the public and the Republicans and others that we need to, the federal government needs to be active and take a lead and spend money. But it's not just an excuse, it actually is a strategy for dealing with China because if the United States doesn't have an attractive model, doesn't have the money to, to build up its defense, doesn't have the money to compete with China's Belt and Road Initiative and so forth, then, then China will win whatever winning means, which is a debatable question. The second element of the Biden China strategy, and it's very, very different from Trump's strategy, is to work with allies and partners. Uh, you saw uh, Japanese Prime Minister Suga visit the White House uh, recently and meet with Biden. 
the Japanese alliance is extremely important, of course, for the United States position in East Asia. People like Kurt Campbell have worked on that alliance for years and years. Uh, it's a, an alliance that has plenty of problems in it, uh, but uh, but which is essential to the success of to the success of U.S.-China policy. The, that's where it, it makes sense that Biden inherits the Quad and looks to a country like India for whatever cooperation India would be able and willing to offer in, in offering the world, as it were, alternatives to Chinese influence. Uh, Biden is cultivating the European partners, trying to put credibility back in NATO. Biden is re-entering the World Health Organization, re-entering the Kyoto uh, Climate Accord, re-entering the Iran deal, um, will re-entering or becoming engaged again in the United Nations Human Rights Council and in the United Nations in general with a very good new UN ambassador, Linda Greenfield Thomas. Um, he may, he hasn't said so yet, but he, I think he may re-enter the, what used to be called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So the idea is that, that the second strategic idea is that the, the big alliance network of the United States is a huge asset that we have that China does not have. On the other hand, the administration is clear that the allies are not going to sort of solve the China problem for the United States because none of the allies has the identical interests with respect to China that the United States has. The Europeans don't have a major security concern. They're not committed, for example, to the defense of Taiwan. The Japanese don't want to be dragged into a war over Taiwan. India, I want to, at the end of my remarks, I want to come back to the question of India, US relations to sort of ask the audience to help me with this important question. But it seems obvious that India doesn't, you know, share all of the security interests of the United States, nor does the United States place the same priority that India places on some of India's concerns. So the allies are important, but they but alliance relationships inherently are difficult and limited. And so the administration doesn't, I think, is, is sophisticated enough to not expect too much out of the alliances. And a, another problem about the alliances is, as many people have pointed out, that the allies cannot, quote unquote, unsee the Trump behavior. They can't forget that, the, that under Trump, the United States was capable of insulting its allies and, 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 and ceasing to cooperate in many respects with its allies. And so the United, because of Trump, the US commitment has come to be regarded as something that's only good for as long as a particular president is in office and unpredictable after that. So this is a big problem. The third element of Biden's China strategy that is different from the Trump strategy is a much is an I was going to say a much heavier emphasis on human rights, but I think I, I should simply say an emphasis on human rights in the following sense that Trump himself placed no emphasis whatsoever on human rights. Some of his officials did again the the Pompeo uh, Pence group did emphasize human rights, but in a very uh, narrow fashion as essentially religious rights. Part of the Pompeo and Pence personal individual political strategy for their, for their political lives after Trump was to appeal to the Trump base. And both of these men have have strong political bases in the uh, American evangelical Christian community. So to the extent that either of them talked about human rights, which from time to time they did very emphatically, they were chiefly concerned with religious rights. And that meant the rights of Christians around the world. And then if 
And then to sort of show sincerity, they would also speak about the rights of Muslims around the world when it came to China, the, the Xinjiang, the Uyghur issue. But their concept of human rights was number one was narrow and number two, it was not coming from the president. It was their own freelancing. In the Biden administration, it's, it's different. They are interested in in, in, in the full range of human rights. Now I'm very, I teach a course, undergraduate course called Introduction to Human Rights and I'm 100% aware of the issue of the so-called American exceptionalism that the United States wants other, you know, wants to use human rights against other countries but doesn't, doesn't itself accede to core treaties and so forth and so on. And this is true. I teach about that in my class, but Though that is true, nonetheless, the Biden administration has elevated human rights in its global foreign policy and has made it an important part of its China policy. And I think there are five reasons for this. Um, th so I'm talking about my third element of Biden's strategy. And now I want to talk about five reasons for that third element. I hope that that is not going to confuse people with all the numbers. But the first reason why human rights is important in the Biden China policy really is that I think Biden and, and um, Anthony Blinken and Kurt Campbell and the other key policymakers honestly believe in the importance of human rights. And I think, you know, this is perhaps a somewhat overlooked feature of American foreign policy is that the people making the policy often have a very deep personal commitment to human rights, despite the problems of getting certain treaties through the Senate and things like that. So that's important. And I know when I've contacted members of the administration, even in the Trump administration in the State Department and the NSC about certain human rights cases, you know, the person on the other end of the line is honestly wants to cooperate out of personal commitment. That said though, Another reason why human rights is part of Biden's China strategy is a more political reason, which is that it's always been difficult in the United States to explain to the broad American public why the United States is spending so much money on far-flung defense bases, a, a big diplomatic corps, even though it's under budgeted, foreign aid, why, you know, we're a continent, we're separated by two oceans from the rest of the world. Why do we have to be involved in Asia at all is something that has always been difficult to sell to the average American voter. And it is for long has been the case under President Truman, under President Carter, under Clinton, that you could explain these foreign policy commitments to the American public in a sentence or two by talking about human rights and democracy. And you didn't have to get into all the complexities of strategy and that still works. So the administration is presenting the struggle with China as a clash of values and a clash of systems to again, repeat what Biden said, we have to show that democracy works better than authoritarianism. A third value, if you will, strategic value of human rights in American China policy is that it is the one thing that most of our allies agree with us about. So with the Europeans, they may not agree, for example, or have a stake. They may not disagree, but they don't have a deep uh, uh, national interest in, say, the security of Taiwan, but the Europeans do believe in the importance of human rights. And that's true with the Australians, and it's true, you know, uh, with many of our, with the Japanese. And, and so it provides a sort of a, a, a core basis for the work with the allies. Uh, another value of human rights in a strategic sense is that it remains a weak point of Chinese foreign policy as China seeks to expand its soft power, its influence around the world, although some some authoritarian leaders like the Chinese model and some parts of the global public like the Chinese model for its efficiency and its effectiveness. Excuse me, let me turn that off. Um, um, but a lot of publics 
in Europe, Japan, and Australia, and to some extent as well in other parts of in the so-called global south, and I'm sure in, in India very much so, are and in the Muslim world are aware of the, the human rights violations in China and consider that to, uh, to be a, a, a negative of the Chinese model. And finally, I think, we we need to keep up pressure on China's human rights because it it does make life it, it encourages those human rights activists within China and and makes life more difficult for the Chinese government. Okay, back to the the major strategic elements of Biden that are innovative. The fourth innovative one that's different from the Trump administration is a search for areas of cooperation with China. So the Biden administration does not interpret strategic competition as 100% as a, 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 a um, you know, uh, zero, what is the word I'm looking for? Zero sum relationship with China. It believes that cooperation is possible with China and is, is in fact imperative with China on certain issues. The obvious example of this is climate change. Without cooperation between China and the United States on climate change, the world is going to, you know, to burn up and we're all going to die. Uh, now, recently, Foreign Minister Wang Yi of China was quoted as saying something about this that I think was mis interpreted by the media. Uh, he was misunderstood as saying that if the United States uh, criticizes China on human rights, China will not cooperate on climate change. The fine print of what he said was more nuanced, although I don't have the quote to give you right now, but it was more of a, it was a vaguer threat. And I think it is safe to say, and I think that the Biden administration believes that China will cooperate on climate change if the United States takes significant measures itself on climate change. If the United States takes significant measures on climate change, then China uh, has to do so, or otherwise the benefit of American actions will, uh, will, will disappear and China will suffer the consequences. If on the other hand, the United States does not take measures on climate change, then it's no use China doing so, and they, they might not. But in other words, it's kind of, uh, uh, China has to do it if the United States does it for their own, absolutely for their own interest. The other big area, and the trip of John Kerry to China uh, last week shows that this is the Biden administration policy, and in my uh, impression, shows that that policy is gonna work with respect to climate change. The other big area of mandatory cooperation is with respect to global health. And then there are other areas of cooperation that are very, very desirable and not, not mandatory. Global infrastructure, the Iran problem, the North Korea problem. There's a lot of potential for cooperation where interests overlap and the Biden administration strategies to pursue those areas, to pursue those potentials. Now cooperation, you know, sitting in, <coughs> in New Jersey, being an, a university professor, it's easy for me to talk about cooperation in very broad terms, but I would like to point out to everybody, and I'm sure that you, <coughs> uh, you know, have thought of this already, that when one gets down into the details of cooperation, it becomes much more difficult. It's not easy at all, because there is always the question, if we embark on a, a, a cooperative program with respect, for example, to climate change, who will benefit more from the, the projects that are undertaken? So for example, in the area of climate change, there's the question of who's gonna control the new technologies that are needed to ameliorate climate change, the uh, you know we saw that uh, that struggle 
play out in the solar panel business where there was a big struggle between the Chinese, the Europeans and the Americans for who would control the solar panel business and the Chinese won that struggle. Um, uh, so all of the new technologies, hydrogen uh, powered vehicles, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, carbon recovery technology and so forth, whoever controls those technologies is going to make a lot of money and have a lot of influence in the 21st century. So you can cooperate, but as you cooperate, you're still competing. The same thing is true with global public health and with all of these other areas that co cooperation and has under it intense competition. There's also the question of the distribution of costs. Who's going to pay more for these cooperations? Um, and there is the problem of distrust, which can never be ameliorated. I, I see some writing by people saying the two countries trust distrust each other and they should trust more. That's impossible. Uh, distrust is built into international affairs. So cooperation is not an easy strategy to pursue, but it is part of the Biden-China strategy. The final element of the Biden-China strategy that I want to uh, mention is, um, is what I'll call partial decoupling. As I said, some members of the Trump administration wanted to pursue complete or nearly complete decoupling. And that was Peter Navarro in particular, who had a lot of influence with the president. I don't know that Trump bought into that vision because he doesn't think long-term, but he allowed Navarro to advocate for quite a few policies, including the trade war and including the ban on Huawei and and other uh, uh, um, the, uh, the effort to dissuade allies from using Huawei ZTE equipment and so forth that, that, that Navarro thought would be pushing toward decoupling. Um, and there was also a faction in the Trump administration, the so-called Wall Street faction, Gary Cohn, who was for a time the economic advisor, and then he left the administration, Mnuchin, uh, uh, Trump's uh, son-in-law Kushner, who didn't want decoupling because they felt that the finance industry still could make a huge amount of money in China. So, de and I think that uh, that that from a, a analytical point of view, decouple full decoupling is not really feasible. It's not imaginable. It would be bringing back supply chains for very complex supply chains from really all around the world to the United States where they wouldn't be economically viable. Um, this is a debate, but I, my view is that decoupling, full decoupling was never possible, but partial decoupling I think is, has become inevitable. And that is the creation of at least two and maybe three if you count into Europe as a third one, three independent cyber uh, economies. Because of the crucial nature of 5G and all kinds of cyber infrastructure to the security of any nation, if you're using Chinese equipment, I don't know what equipment India is using, I should have looked that up, but it just occurs to me now that, that I should have looked it up. But if you're using Chinese equipment, the Chinese are going to be able to spy on you. There is no, I'm not, I don't claim to be a cyber expert, but I think this is something that even an ordinary person like me knows. If you use Chinese equipment, the Chinese can spy on you and the Chinese can turn off your electricity and your water. If you use American equipment, the Americans can spy on you and can turn off your electric and water. And if you're using European equipment, the Europeans can do it. I just think that the, in the cyber domain, the defense is always behind. And we've seen so many examples of this. And the only way to be secure is to have your own system. And that, in that area, I believe decoupling is gonna occur. 
But in terms of many other big parts of the economy, decoupling will not occur. So I think that what I've just described is the Biden policy on economic relations. Now I'm coming close to out of time, but I, I want to uh, have a couple more uh, points to make. So that's my view of the Biden China policy and my answer to the question of is it old wine and new bottles? It's not, it's really quite new compared to the Trump policy in its details, in its strategic details. Is the Biden policy gonna, gonna work? Is it a good policy? There is of course criticism of it. So there remains the criticism on the right from people like uh, Pompeo, Pence, Newt Gingrich, Steve Bannon and so forth that China represents an existential threat to American civilization and we have to really do everything to fight back. We can't cooperate. We've got to beef up military pol political pressure and have a so-called new Cold War. There is also a critique from, I would say, China doves. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily put them on the left, I, but, but China doves who argue that China has legitimate security aspirations that should be acceptable to the United States. The US should find a graceful way to abandon Taiwan. Um, it should uh, not uh, go so hard on human rights and it should try to negotiate a kind of a new G2 global condominium. Uh, the Biden administration policy is in between these two extremes. And I think the Biden administration policy makes sense. I do not think China is a existential threat to Western civilization. It doesn't have an, an ideological program like the old Soviet Union had for the whole world. It doesn't have an alternative view of the world order. It wants more influence in the world order. It's not militarily expansionist in the sense that Taiwan is something that China has always claimed and which I think under international law, it has a good claim to. And beyond Taiwan, it's not planning to invade or doesn't have launch a claim against anybody. And, and, and the same thing about the, the two Indian territorial disputes with China is that I don't see these as aggression in the sense that they are longstanding claims that have some kind of legal, I'm not trying to take sides on it, but it seems to me they're sort of legacy claims rather than representing an expansionist ambition. And thank God, I think the Chinese leaders are realists and they are not adventurists. They're not crazy, they're not Hitler. And they will, they will respond in a rational manner to American policy. If American policy is effective, then Chinese policy will adjust. On the other hand, there are some very, very hard issues uh, between the two sides. And the most important of these is Taiwan. The Taiwan situation is very, very dangerous. It's hard for Americans to I think for most Americans to really understand why Taiwan is so important. Why is it important to China? Why don't the Chinese just let the Taiwanese have what they want? And why is it important to the United States? It's very far away and it's relatively small and it's in China's you know, natural sphere of influence. But the fact is that Taiwan is very, very important to both sides for, for good strategic reasons, as well as for reasons of in the Chinese case, there are nationalism reasons. In the American case, democracy reasons. But there are also very hard material strategic reasons why Taiwan is important to both sides. China will, in my opinion, never give up. Even if Sri Mati and I are, become the government of China, we won't give up our ambition to control Taiwan, near, nor will the United States readily abandon Taiwan, which is so important to our credibility and to our position in Asia. So this is a dangerous situation. There's a new paper out from the Council on Foreign Relations by Robert Blackwell and Philip Zelico about the Taiwan issue that says that the American military strategy for deterring a Chinese attack on Taiwan has, is no longer viable. 
I can I can explain why, and I agree with that. I can explain why that is if we have time in the discussion. And they re recommend a, a very sophisticated, nuanced, largely political strategy. And the Pentagon is debating over different deployments and equipment. The Taiwan problem is a big problem. So I come out with a sort of... Um, mixed pessimistic optimistic view of the US-China relationship. I think it is possible for us to navigate our way through this strategic competition over the course of some decades without a catastrophe, but it is not guaranteed because the Taiwan issue is so important to both sides. Finally, if I can just have a sentence or two about what all of this means for India. And I, I put this forward in a very uh, humble way because I'm speaking to you and you have thought about this in a lot more depth and you know a lot more than I do about it. But when I think about it from a sort of simple point of view of what are India's most important strategic concerns and what are the United States' most important strategic concerns? In the case of India, I would say, and here I'm talking about, not about domestic security for the moment, then it's gonna be Pakistan, it's gonna be Chinese influence in Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, it's gonna be uh, Tibet and so forth. And none of these things is a primary security concern for the United States. Of course, the United States is aware of it, but it's not, it's not at the top of the list. And in the case of the United States, the primary concerns as regards China have to do with uh, Japan, North Korea, Taiwan, the South China Sea, which are not are, which are issues in which India has an interest, but not a primary security interest. The chief area where very important security interests overlap between the two countries is the Indian Ocean and whether the Chinese Navy will become a big factor in the Indian Ocean. I think there's room and you know we've seen co some room for cooperation there, but I think you know my, my conclusion is a very conventional one here which is that the prospects for India-US cooperation around the China issue are quite limited. They do exist, they are important and valuable to both sides, but they're quite limited. I put that out there as a question really to ask uh, for your feedback. So let me stop there. I'm a little bit over my assigned amount of time, but um, uh, not too far over. And I really look forward to questions and comments and discussion. Thank you very much, Professor Nathan, for a very fascinating and absorbing lecture. Uh, I don't have the capacity to uh, make a good summary of this uh, excellent lecture, but I'll just uh, point out what you said in the beginning, and that is that on the surface, though it looks as though uh, there is not much difference between the Trump and the Biden administration, but deep inside there are differences, which you pointed out. And you said that policy is strategic according to uh, the Biden administration. And there is a unanimity in the United States that China is a threat and a strategic competitor. And things like human rights is an important issue. Now, I will not keep the audience away from their questions and answers, that, uh, questions that they have for you, questions and comments. So... Uh, Rija and Colonel Venkert will probably help me and someone in, uh, uh, in this because uh, I saw many questions in the chat box and, um, and some hands raised. So uh, how do I start? I'm not very sure, but uh, can uh, Rija and uh, someone or Colonel Venkert just help me in this? The question answer session will be for half an hour. Yes, Rija.
Rijia, are you there? Would you like me to look at the chat and? If you if you can, yeah, yeah. Because okay, I have to squinch down to look. <laughs> uh, one second, I can just read out a question. There was a question from General. Yeah, Nashman. yeah, please, someone where yeah. Uh, yeah. That um, if he understands the statement correctly, you said that President Trump considered human rights issues a lower priority than his colleagues. Then how do you explain the laws that he got passed relating to Tibet, Xinjiang, and also his reactions to China's moves in Hong Kong? So this is a question by General Narsimhan. Um, how tr you say Trump's laws about? What, say, could you say that again? Um, if Trump, Trump did Trump place the lower issues a lower priority than his uh, than perhaps his predecessors, then how do you explain the laws that he got passed relating to Tibet, Xinjiang, and also his reactions to China's moves in Hong Kong? Okay, so as far as I know, Trump had nothing to do with any laws that were passed about Tibet and Xinjiang. They were uh, not sponsored, you know, promoted by him. Uh, they were, uh, and he, his reaction, I don't remember that Trump had any reaction to the events in Hong Kong either. The, the Pompeo uh, State Department, um, I can't remember now, honestly. I, I, I don't think that, that uh, so that's, that's the best answer I can give to this question is I don't think that Trump personally said anything about any of those issues. Oh, what, what he did say about Xinjiang was that he, he, he supported President Xi's crackdown in Xinjiang. This was a statement that he made privately that was leaked. And at the moment, I can't remember the exact circumstances of it. Yeah, that's the best answer I can give to that question. Probably I didn't give a very good answer, but that's the best I can do. Sure. There was also a question uh, from uh, Ambassador Vishnu Prakash. If I could just ask him to unmute himself and ask his question. Uh, Ambassador, would you like to yeah, ask? Yeah. yeah, I will. I hope I'm audible. Uh, yes. Sir. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Greet, uh, greetings, uh, Professor Nathan. I j just had two questions. One, when you said that China has a sense of insecurity, I, I would argue that it is more posturing because that is how they build a ground for doing whatever they want to do, like uh, the propaganda that they have to wipe out a century of humiliation. Because for developing countries, uh, including India, I mean, we have 200 years of colonial rule. So every country that way has a century or two centuries of humiliation, but you don't go about fighting with other countries. That is one. On Taiwan, I think that is the acid test for, China, for uh, the US because US is seen as the net security provider and the US has security treaties with a number of countries. And if Taiwan is let down, uh, and if China allow, is allowed to use force against Taiwan and get away with that, I think that will uh, greatly Im impact uh, on US standing in the, in the Indo-Pacific region. Would appreciate your comments. Thank you. Yeah, on that second point, I agree with you. And when I try to explain to students you know, why does, why is the U.S. so committed to Taiwan? It's 10,000 miles away and so on. Um, that is the primary reason. If you can imagine if the U.S., so the U.S. doesn't have a treaty commitment to Taiwan, but it, it has this Taiwan Relations Act and the whole history that gives, you know, is a de facto, as you said, commitment to the defense of Taiwan. And if that commitment turns out to be e either the US lacks political will or lacks military capability to fulfill that commitment. You can imagine how South Korea, Japan, Australia, the NATO allies would rethink. Allies are always rethinking 
the, the credibility of the American security commitment. It's always a question, that's natural. But if the US doesn't uh, effectively protect Taiwan, then, then the answer has, as you said, that's the answer to that. It's the acid test. And so that's, I think, the number one American interest in Taiwan. The other American interest in Taiwan that has now emerged is Taiwan's command of advanced chip technology, the Taiwan uh, TSMC, Taiwan, I forget what that stands for, you know, company that produces these advanced chips, which are crucial to the control of the so many sectors of the 21st century economy. It's also, uh, is a democracy. So the question of democratic values comes into that. On your first point about insecurity, it's true that the Chinese government um, does the propaganda about the 100 years of humiliation and China standing up and China resuming its place and so forth. And that propaganda is effective. But I think it's also true that uh, China has no allies. China is surrounded by countries that do not trust China, that the United States has uh, military forces surrounding China, that the United States Navy dominates the global supply chains and so on and so forth. So both things I think are true at the same time. You can't really say that today, if, if you Ambassador Prakash were the president of China, you wouldn't say, well, my country is sufficiently secure. I'm gonna cut my military budget and just, count on the Americans not to attack me. You, you wouldn't say that, and I wouldn't say that. Right, okay. uh, there's a, uh, sure. Uh, I think there's a question from uh, uh, Krishna Vadma uh, about how far and with what degree of commitment is the Biden administration expected to pursue the policy of um, blocking off China from stealing technology? Is strengthening quad, the quad an effective way forward and how? So this question of China stealing technology is, is very important um, because uh, it has both military and economic implications. The military implication is just building on what I was just saying with Ambassador Prakash that, you know, we have to find a way to uh, effectively deter a Chinese attack. And a lot of it is technology. So China has developed this, uh, you know, so-called asymmetric capabilities, anti-access area denial, A2AD capabilities of submarines, of space, cyber missiles, and so forth. And the United States relies upon its technological edge to uh, credibly deter China, because in fact, the Chinese Navy has become bigger than the American Navy and China's closer to the Taiwan, you know, uh, war zone than the United States. Technology is essential. It is also essential to the prosperity of the economy, not just military technology, but bio tech, you know, new bio tech. I don't, I'm not a big tech guy, but new technology and in bi biological engineering, new technology and autonomous vehicles and uh, so forth. Whoever controls these technologies is gonna make a lot of money and be more prosperous. And China has many both legal and illegal ways of acquiring technology from the United States and from Europe and Japan as well. Some of it is espionage that's illegal. A lot of it is actually not illegal. It's reading scientific and technological journals. It's purchasing or buying a stake in American and European companies. It is sending visiting scholars and PhD students into, you know, departments of American universities that are doing advanced research and so forth. So yes, I, the Biden administration, the Trump administration, not Trump himself, but Christopher Wray, the FBI guy, and some members of Congress as well, and, and the intelligence community have been very, very concerned about this. And that concern has continued. Now, the, the hard part of the question 
that was asked is what can we do about it? And that's really, really tough. So for example, the idea that, okay, let's not let any American, any Chinese uh, students and scholars come and study in American physics or engineering or chem departments would be just self-destructive. We shouldn't do that, but how to know which things to, um, which uh, programs to allow to be open and which ones have to be closed, very tough. Uh, do, you, do you cut off academic cooperation? Do you, one thing they are doing, the Congress is gonna pass a law to uh, make it more difficult to, to put more federal scrutiny into Chinese uh, investments in high tech firms in the United States and the Europeans are also doing that. So this is not an easy problem to solve at all. And I'm not the one with sort of a, a, an original answer to it, but I know that the government is working on it. And this is an element of continuity, but between Trump and Biden, it's, um, it's, it's a consensus point. Uh, thank you. Uh, there's a question from Rushali Saha. Uh, can we expect a return to the Obama era pivot strategy under the Biden presidency, given his close involvement in formulating the same under President Obama? Um, yes, well, yes, not with that name anymore, right? But, but insofar as the pivot strategy was, had the element of uh, working more with allies, for example, putting more pressure on Japan to cooperate with the United States in planning for a Taiwan contingency and had the element as well of increasing uh, US military deployments in Asia, those, those two parts of the pivot strategy are continuing, but the, the, the name of it has not been revived. The, the, the pivot strategy, oh, and a third element of the pivot strategy was a more intense diplomatic engagement with, for example, with ASEAN. Uh, and we haven't seen that yet in the Biden administration. But, you know, Kurt Campbell, who's the Asia czar for Biden, was, was really the, the designer of the details of the pivot strategy. So I think the same elements of strategy are, are there. In the, in the Biden administration, it wasn't very successful, especially the military part of it was, was really not much. And um, you see Biden announcing the end of the war in Afghanistan. And I think that's part of what many have long advocated, which is that the United States needs to take its military budget and personnel and put them where the real security issue, I, let me restate that, you know, Afghanistan is a real security issue, but to put, put our assets in the place that's most important. Um, and there are many important areas, including Europe, and we have to deter Russian aggression in Europe. But I think the Biden administration views Asia as the number one security uh, concern for the United States. So in that sense of, of shifting resources to Asia, but how to shift, you can't just take the existing military assets, let's say aircraft carriers and put them in Asia and deter China because China's asymmetric military strategy has already uh, created the ability to sink aircraft carriers. So it takes a much more fundamental rethink of the deployments and the platforms. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I'd also like to call on our director, Ambassador Kanta. I believe he wants to present the question as well. Thank you, Professor Nathan, for that uh, brilliant lecture of yours. You know, I agree with you that uh, Biden administration's China policy is significantly different from Trump administration's. <clears throat> you know, my, my one question that I have, you know, you talked about uh, 100 days of Biden administration. Uh, do you think uh, administration's China policy has already taken concrete form or is it still work in progress? Uh, do you expect the policy to keep evolving as uh, with passage of time? Uh, that's one. 
my second question is you no know, you brought out the two aspects of biden administration's china policy one you know in sense of continuity uh, treating china as a strategic competitor but biden at the same time uh, is looking at china cooperation with china in certain critical areas like climate change or provision of global public goods as an imperative how these two aspects will sort of interface with each other to what mm. extent the biden administration is prepared to moderate its strategic competition with china to accommodate the imperative of cooperation a third yeah. question if you permit me you know if uh, this is in fact you mentioned in passing and you promised to elaborate on it further during discussion stage uh, you rightly brought out that uh, taiwan is a very big factor in us china relations uh, you seem to suggest that uh, the us ability to defend taiwan is somewhat doubtful uh, can you please elaborate on it yeah um so on your first question i think that biden china policy is already clear i mean i of course i could be wrong but my assessment is these uh, five elements that i described are are, are the direction the it, it, it didn't, didn't require you know his his uh, china people throughout the government didn't have to start studying china when they came into office nor did he right they're all very very experienced and they knew what they wanted to do and they've started to do it so i think the, the strategy that i've outlined is going to continue and of course as it continues it will either succeed or fail in some respects and so on and there would be adjustments but at the level that i'm describing it i don't expect you know a change of direction that's in your first question on your second question the chinese diplomatic strategy has always been the one that you suggested which is I'll cooperate with you if you stop criticizing me. It's interesting how incredibly sensitive they are to human rights criticisms. They could just say, "Go ahead, criticize." You know, if you criticize the United States, for example, for human rights, and you would be absolutely justified in doing so. And the Chinese do it, criticize the United States for our, you know, racism policies and our. Uh, bad policies toward the poor and all those kinds of things uh the U us doesn't care doesn't listen uh but the chinese government is hugely sensitive to these criticisms coming from overseas which is kind of a puzzle it suggests that they feel more they know something we don't know about how vulnerable they are to domestic opposition anyway be that as it may they have always suggested you you know you play nice with us and we'll play nice with you i don't th think that the biden administration is going to fall for that i think the biden administration policy is look human rights is an interest of ours we're going to uh, articulate that we're not going to send the marines to overthrow you but we're going to say what we want to say it's important to us and on your part china's part we expect that you will and this is a good thing about the chinese government as i said before is that i think we can expect the chinese government to pursue their own interests in a very rational manner because they're disciplined and they're thoughtful and smart so so the biden administration will say to them we're criticizing you on human rights and we're offering you this opportunity to do x y and z with climate or with north korea and so on and if you think it's in your interest you'll do it so my answer to your question is no i don't think the biden administration will fall into the trap of moderating the competitive and remember the chief the number one part of the competition strategy is build back better in the united states which is something that china won't ask us to uh, give up on taiwan uh the the old american strategy for defending taiwan was based upon sending aircraft carriers into the 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 battle space and 
using the planes on these aircraft carriers to frustrate a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. I mean, of course, it's far, far more complicated than that, but that was the guts of the strategy. And now China's uh, capabilities are untested, of course, but uh, the Pentagon believes that they have the capability to sink an aircraft carrier uh, with submarines or with missiles, as well as to hit American bases Guam, Okinawa, Yokosuka, if they want to, with missiles. And that will potentially prevent the United States. So it's a question of political will, right? Which is kind of weak because there is this debate in the United States with some influential people saying, let's give up Taiwan. So if, if, uh, if the Joint Chiefs of Staff come into the White House and tell the president that the Chinese are launching an invasion and we can send aircraft carriers, but those aircraft carriers might be sunk and the aircraft carrier has 7,000 personnel on it, it's an intolerable, it's not a good choice to present to the president. So the Pentagon <coughs> has, uh, has uh, tried to suggest to Taiwan that there should be a sort of a poison pill strategy that Taiwan should build up its own asymmetric capabilities and make itself so difficult to invade that the Chinese would be deterred from invading it. But nobody really believes that that would solve the problem. The United States needs a way uh, to, to credibly deter, raise the price for China for an invasion attempt. And China has a lot of different potential strategies, embargo, uh, you know, subversion and so forth. But the, you know, sort of main strategy is this idea of bombing Taiwan and then having an amphibious invasion, which they're prepared to do. They have the training for that kind of a thing. So that that's what I meant. I, I, I haven't fully explained it because it's very complicated and uh, and even my own understanding of it is only that of a civilian, but that's the big picture. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. I'd also like to call on Ambassador Saurabh Kumar. I believe he wants to ask a question. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Professor Nathan. <clears throat> I also enjoyed your talk and listening to your answers. But you won't mind if I make a question to you and a comment with it. See, you said that the Trump administration thought China to be an existential threat. You didn't think so to the US. So oh, I'm sorry, Ambassador. Why I say that, please? But you Can also you say that again. The Trump administration thought what? China was an existential threat to the US. Oh, yeah, yeah. But you didn't think so. But you also said that in the cyber area, there are three main players, and depending on whom a particular country goes with, it is vulnerable to that country attacking its basic infrastructure. So China, EU, or the US. So if that's not a not an existential threat, what is the capacity? You have the technology, the capacity to do that. And it is expanding. You also have the capacity to supply it at a cheap price. So how do you say then that it is not an existence? And may I make my comment here? This is the question. You see, despite your very good talk, the overall impression we are left with is you're saying a bit of this and a bit of that. The Trump administration, for whatever its reputation, took a clear view towards the end after the four speeches by the four leading officials of the Trump administration in June last year, took a clear position, creating a, what's called a moment of awareness about the Frankenstein kind of monster, that strategic indulgence by the US above all and by the West in general had led to post 71 under the Kissingerian framework. So this recognition that there had been an omission in perception, above all, which led to gaps in policy. Now, there's no point denying it. We can't go back on that moment of awareness. 
we may handle it differently and the biden administration like any other succeeding administration would do it its own way so there's no point getting into in my view the the details of how they are doing little different or little that is that basic perception there or not does is it tenable in our view or not particularly scholars and others that is the question they have to address thank you very much oh thank you <clears throat> you know <clears throat> i uh accept your <clears throat> criticism that i'm saying a bit of this and a bit of that because i'm a great admirer of the indian foreign service <laughs> i know that you guys you guys cannot get away with saying a bit of this and a bit of that you 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 have to be very very clear and strong and you are so i accept that criticism humbly <clears throat> um uh on the existential threat thing what i met, what what some people in and around trump seem to believe well so you'll have rhetoric from uh people like pompeo pence bannon gingrich that the chinese threaten our way of life or they threaten our civilization and i think what they're saying is something like the chinese are not white and they're not christian and we uh and, and they're you know yellow ants and things like this they they don't say it like that but they're basically saying that if china takes over the world we're going to lose our american way of life that's what i was alluding to now you're quite right that if china <clears throat> were to get control over our cyber infrastructure and make all of our cars and trucks crash and <laughs> turn off the traffic lights and the water and stuff that would be a very severe threat uh and you could even call it an existential threat but i don't think that there's any rational chinese strategy for you know like invading the united states and taking over the government of the united states and eliminating the autonomy of the united states or even launching an unprovoked attack on our cyber infrastructure but i agree those are two separate things and if you want to say that crashing our infrastructure is an existential threat i can accept that on your other question about the trump breakthrough you know i'm i'm not one of the people who likes trump so it's very hard for me to give trump much credit for anything honestly speaking but what i tried to argue <clears throat> is that the Trump administration happened to be the moment when a long standing rethink of of the China US relationship culminated so yes you're right it happened on his watch uh, as somebody said in the chat it it started with obama with the pivot uh you know a lot of people contributed to it but trump did come in and dramatize this and sort of consolidate and crystallize the consensus so you're right uh it was a kind of breakthrough and it is a permanent breakthrough it has permanently changed uh american opinion but not only american you know so i mean this same breakthrough has occurred in australia and in and europe and perhaps in india i'm not I think India has long been very suspicious of China and I think maybe we have to give credit if you will to Xi Jinping it's Xi Jinping's assertive self-confident uh foreign policy that has caused a very widespread reaction not only in the United States someone where I think we have time to just squeeze in one question we oh, have okay. to end it by you know maybe 8 at 35 indian time and 11 11 5 sure. new york sure. time i'll just one last question one last question uh, from uh, varun sharma that do the events at anchorage during the china american diplomats meet demonstrate that china is going to be an aggressor and does it mean that the biden administration has to catch up and reorient its policy towards china basically just the effects of the recent meet at anchorage 
So the two sides gave, you know, tough public talks, and then we heard, uh, without no, seeing the transcript, that in the private talks they were more, you know, pragmatic. I wouldn't say cooperative, but sort of talking about practical things. Uh, so I'm, you know, so the the U.S. has uh, come out of the box with this strategy that I described, which heavily includes the human rights component. And it's, a, I think, understandable, and we would expect the Chinese side to forcefully respond and articulate their own position. They have a strong position that certainly makes sense in its own way that our human rights is our own business, Taiwan is our territory, the South China Sea is is undeniably Chinese territory and so on. They have their own position and they're very articulate about it. I don't find that at all surprising. I don't expect the Chinese to sort of knuckle under uh, to any of the American positions. It's going to continue to be a competitive and uh, c conflictual, I don't mean uh, with armed conflict inevitable, but uh, rhetorical conflict and diplomatic competition and conflict is going to continue. I think I said in my remarks for several decades, which is, you know, a rough estimate. I don't think that that either side is going to back down in, in any foreseeable future. And it's going we're going to have tension. We're all going to live in an atmosphere of tension for a long, long time. But I hope it won't uh, eventuate in, in, in a cat catastrophic conflict. Okay, maybe one more question. Someone oh, where you can... Okay, because I was just going to uh, say that perhaps you can maybe give the concluding remarks because it's already 826. So in case you have any questions you'd like to, questions or comments to make or any concluding remarks. Who are you saying this to? To you, ma'am. To you. Oh, no, of course, I'll give the concluding remarks. But in case there's one or there are one or two more people who have any questions, we can allow them to ask. Uh, if... I think we've gone through the questions. Um, there okay. are a variety okay. of comments. So maybe you could just uh, uh, go ahead with the concluding remarks. Okay, you why don't you read one of the comments at least? Um, Sure. Um, uh, Master Saurav Kumar uh, did say that uh, there is no racial slur to the perception of China being an existential threat, but surely the fact that China's capabilities are not as bad as they could be is not the only thing that should determine our perceptions. Would you like to comment on that, on to that comment? Um. I'm not sure I understood the comment that China's capabilities are not as bad as they could be. Yeah. Oh, Ambassador Kumar, was that your comment? Yes, please unmute Ambassador Saurabh Kumar. Unmute him. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yes, please. That was in response to what you were saying. You know, they're not able to do this. They're not able to influence the American welfare. So there are many things they can't do, and maybe some attributions on the U.S. side don't hold water. But my main point was, see, both politically you can dispute whether they are an existential threat to the American way of life. That's a matter of perception. But via the technological route now, today, cyber, if you draw due attention to yourself, they are, so to say, objectively an existential threat. The political thing is subjective. You can argue. I, I, I'm not sure if I would agree with you that they are not an existential threat. To the American way of life or to the world at large, there is a, the values question is not a minor question. So we should not shy away from it. That is the main point. That context, I thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, it's important to try to imagine what would be the worst case scenario. Important, but very, very difficult. 
let's say that the Biden administration is un, you know, unsuccessful in building back better. I mean, there's a, let's say that the United States declines, quote unquote, that our economy doesn't uh, recover, that our growth, growth rate is very low, political polarization continues, allies don't trust us, you know, the whole nine yards, and the United States sort of fades out. Uh, you know, it's still sitting here, but it, it no longer exercises much influence. China then, and let's say that at the same time that China's economy continues to grow and it, it holds together politically and it, it, it breaks through the mid-level income trap and all of those kinds of things and becomes the biggest economy, which it will become. Worst case scenario, then what happens? Well, in that case, China faces a world in which there's still, India is still there, Japan is still there, Russia, Europe, you know, it, so then if, what will China's ambitions be in that scenario? So I'm just suggesting, I, I don't think I have an answer or time to answer this question, but I agree with you that it's important to think about the worst case scenario, but it doesn't necessarily mean that China will replicate the type of hegemony that the United States has exercised for a number of decades. It might not be in China's interests or within the capabilities of China to sort of replicate a, 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 a unipolar system because there are a lot of other powers around. Now, is that existential threat or not? It would be an, an, it seems to me chiefly an existential threat that the United States would impose upon itself in the scenario that I sketched and not imposed upon us by China. Okay, I think that's all we have the time for. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Professor Nathan, for uh, the lecture and for answering the questions. Uh, thanks to the audience for uh, uh, listening to this uh, lecture and also for some of the very interesting questions and provoking questions, pro provocative questions that you have asked. Uh, well, uh, we now come to the end of uh, this year's VP Dutt Memorial Lecture. Uh, however, uh, before I end, I uh, in this uh, program, let me thank uh, India International Center for partnering with us. And also, I want to show my deep appreciation to the junior staff of ICS, Rija Nair, uh, Colonel Venkat, Adhya, and Samanwai Huda for putting this together. They have done a great job. So thank you all once again, and special thanks again to Professor Nathan. Uh, we look forward to your articles uh, for China Report. Uh, we'll be in touch through email. And uh, well, to all of you, stay safe and bye-bye. Thank you to everyone.